Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this NITEC webinar series on SARS-CoV-2, focusing on mutations and variants and strains. Oh, my. Um, we have a wonderful talk today uh, with two wonderful panelists, uh, where we're going to be going over essentially SARS-CoV-2, understanding the difference in the mutations and variants that are starting to uh, emerge across the US and across the world as well. Before we get started, I just want to let everyone know there's a Q&A function if you see at the bottom right uh, corner of your Zoom window. So you're encouraged to ask questions there, and our panelists and I will help answer those questions throughout the afternoon. But you're also uh, able to upvote these questions if you have any questions as well, or that you would like that you'd want us to answer. After the uh, two panelists are going to be speaking, we're going to get together and we're going to have a discussion Q&A uh, for the last about 20 minutes or so of uh, the next hour. And we'll try to answer most of those questions that you have asked. All right, so we have quite a few people that are going to be joining us and we'll be starting now. So can we start the next slide, please? So my name is Radu Postelniko. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician over at Bellevue Hospital uh, in New York City and NYU School of Medicine. Um, I'll be the main uh, moderator for the talk today and we have two wonderful panelists as well. So I'll be doing the welcomes and the introductions and we'll have Dr. Anne Piantradosi from Emory who will be discussing the SARS-CoV-2 variants and mutations. And that's gonna be followed by Dr. Lawler at Nebraska who's gonna be discussing different COVID variants. After that, we're all gonna to get together and uh, we're gonna answer some of your questions and just hopefully, you know, we have over 2000 people that are registered for today. So I'm assuming there's gonna be quite a few different questions. So we'll try to answer as many as we can. And if you ever want to, you can always follow up the, the slides and the video of this lecture will also be uploaded to the NITEC website after this as well. Once we finish with that, um, I'll discuss briefly some of the NITEC resources and then uh, the talk will come to an end in approximately one hour from now. So briefly to just go over again. So the National uh, Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center or NITEC uh, is an organization that was created in 2015 through emergency supplemental funds that was appropriate to the US Department of Health and Human Services, specifically actually to the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response and, the, for the, uh, and to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It's a collaboration between uh, New York City Health and Hospitals Bellevue Emory University and Nebraska Medicine with the overall mission uh, to increase uh, the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. So we have four main areas of uh, our work. Uh, first one is usually through consultation through on-site assessment and uh, in-person metrics as well. There's education as well through in-person and online offerings as one of them is this webinar that we're doing today. There's also technical assistance that's available. Um, and there's also virtual assistance now that's available on at uh, www.needtech.org. And we have a very large research network that's across 10 regional uh, Ebola and other special pathogens treatment centers throughout the United States. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is Dr. Anne uh, Piantadosi with, uh, at Emory, from Emory University. So she's gonna be talking about the introduction to SARS-CoV-2 about variants and mutations. Hi, everybody, and thanks so much to Radu for the introduction and to all of you for joining. Um, I'm really excited for this discussion. Um, my goal over the next 15 to 20 minutes is to really provide you with an introduction to the way that I think about the circulating variants and mutations, um, really with the understanding that this is a complex and ever-changing uh, environment. And so um, I'm going to try to kind of stick to the high points and also provide some resources that I think are really useful in keeping track of this information um, in real time. So the first thing that I think is really important is to start out with some definitions and make sure that we're all kind of on the same page in what we're talking about. And throughout my presentation, I'm really going to distinguish between two important things, one being a mutation and one being a variant. Um, and a mutation, I think we're all familiar with thinking about this idea, is a very specific change in the virus genome. And most of the time, what we think about is a point mutation where one nucleotide in the genome changes to another, maybe one amino acid changes to another. Um, and there can be other types of mutations, like when part of the genome gets deleted. Um, but really, these are very specific changes in the virus's genome. A variant, on the other hand, is a virus that contains multiple mutations in a distinct pattern. Um, and this is important for a couple of reasons. One is that, in general, these mutations are shared by a group of viruses that all descend from a common ancestor. So they're related to one another. Um, and on a practical level, the variant is easy to distinguish from other viruses by genome sequencing. 
So any particular mutation could be shared by any number of viruses, but really when there's a constellation of mutations in a distinct pattern, that's when we start to turn something a variant. And as we're all pretty familiar with, viruses mutate all of the time. Um, and so we really have to always be asking ourselves, when do we care about viruses mutations and when do we care about variants? And I've listed here a couple of reasons why we care for SARS-CoV-2. Um, as we're learning about this new pathogen, we're really interested in identifying mutations and variants that might increase the pathogenicity of the virus, that might increase its transmissibility to be spread from one person to another, um, and really, especially importantly, now that vaccines are being rolled out, um, we're worried about mutations and variants that may allow escape from the immune response. So in highlighting the mutations and variants that we're gonna talk about today, each of them have at least one of these concerning features, um, which is why they've captured our attention. So how do we find mutations and variants? How do we identify them? Um, it's remarkable to me as somebody who's been in a viral genomics field um, to see the incredible and rapid uh, collection of data, not only sequencing virus genomes, but making them publicly available through massive global efforts um, by the worldwide community. And um, what I'm showing on this slide is a, is a graph from GISAID, which is a um, genome sharing uh, organization that was originally des designed around influenza, um, but has now been used to sort of make publicly available and share data um, on SARS-CoV-2 genomics. And what you can see on the x-axis is the date um, of when the samples were sequenced and made available. And on the y-axis is the number of samples that have been made publicly available. Um, and now we're surpassing 500,000 uh, publicly available genomes um, in just over a year, which is really remarkable. Um, and this is a worldwide effort, as I mentioned, within the US. Um, we've just recently, within the last couple of days, surpassed 100,000 virus genomes, which is also quite remarkable. And the sequencing that occurs in the United States um, is really performed by a wide range of organizations, including state health departments, the CDC, academic institutions, nonprofit organizations and companies, um, all working simultaneously and in parallel um, to generate this data. And a lot of the best practices and methods for how this sequencing is performed and how the data is shared um, is coordinated through a CDC group called SPHERES, um, which at the, at the top stands for SARS-CoV-2 Sequencing for Public Health Emergency Response, Epidemiology and Surveillance. Um, and this is a very active group that, um, like I mentioned, is a, a number of people working together towards this common goal. So what has the global community been able to find out um, with all of this incredible sequencing effort? Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, um, I'll start by introducing some of these variants um, that have been in the news and have been capturing people's attention and just mention why um, they're of such concern. And the first one that I wanna talk about is this variant that is called B117. And this is also known as the UK variant. Um, and for reasons that I'll describe in a moment, it's also known as 501YB1. Um, and this is a map here from a website that I really like to help not only explain, but also keep track um, of up-to-date data about uh, the variants. And so hopefully you can see that link at the bottom. Um, it's covlineages.org. Um, and they really provide kind of up-to-date information about the number of variants and where they are and, and other information. So this first variant, B117, was originally called the UK variant because it originally was noticed in the UK. And you can see on the map, um, the UK is the area with the largest number of sequences where this has been reported, um, but it's really a global variant at this point. Um, it's all throughout the world. It's also at this point pretty widespread within the United States. Um, so this is a really nice, another web resource um, from the CDC where you can keep track of the number of cases um, of each variant uh, across all of the states. And they also have really nice explanations of the variants themselves. So B117 is also widely um, recognized within the US, um, primarily within Florida and California, um, and was kind of the first of the three lineages that I'm going to be talking about today that um, started gaining attention uh, just around December of last year. So why do we care about B117? Well, there are a couple of findings that have come out that have made this a variant of concern. Um, the first, as uh, I've sort of demonstrated on the maps, is that it's been increasing in frequency. 
Um, and in addition, one of the reasons it's been increasing in frequency is because there's evidence growing from multiple lines of investigation that it's actually more transmissible. So a person who's infected with B117 is going to, on average, infect more people than somebody who's infected with the traditional variant of the virus. Part of the reason why it's more transmissible is because it's actually associated with higher viral loads. So when you measure the virus level in somebody's nasopharyngeal swab, somebody who has this variant tends to have a higher virus level, which accounts for more transmissibility. Um, and then really um, kind of the most up-to-date concern about this variant is that it could actually also be associated with higher pathogenicity. So there've been a, a couple of recent um, studies coming out of the UK looking at you know, potentially higher mortality in patients who, who are uh, infected with this variant. So how, does, how do these features kind of arise in the variant? And one way that we try to identify that by looking at, at the virus genome is not looking at the variant as a whole, but actually looking at some of its individual mutations. And I mentioned that a variant is a virus that contains distinct mutations in a distinct pattern. Um, and there's actually 23 mutations in variant B117, um, which is a lot actually for SARS-CoV-2. So how, how might we sort of decide which, which mutations are potentially more important? Scientists in general are really interested in mutations that occur within a specific region of the virus called the receptor binding domain. And this is known as the RBD. And what this is is part of the spike protein it can affect both how the virus infects cells as well as its susceptibility to antibodies. So these little red boxes are highlighting the blue spike protein on the outer surface of the virus. And you can see in the panel on the left, when the virus goes to infect a cell, it has to interact with the ACE2 receptor. And the way that it does that is through this receptor binding domain. So mutations that occur in the RBD might make the virus able to bind better to the ACE2 receptor. And then what you're also seeing on the panel on the right is that this spike protein and the RBD in particular are also really good targets for antibodies. So because that region is so important for the virus to infect a cell, it's also a very kind of appealing target for antibodies. So the th second thing that could happen in the RBD that would be concerning would be to have mutations arising that allow escape from antibodies. And when this has been investigated for this specific mutation, uh, 501Y, um, this has been determined to be an important mutation in the B117 variant because it does, in fact, increase binding to the ACE2 receptor. So like I was showing on the left-handed panel um, in the previous slide. Fortunately, however, it does not seem to be associated with reduced neutralization, which was the right-handed uh, panel in the previous slide. So this mutation, N501Y, is thought to be potentially an explanation for how the virus is able to bind more to the receptor, cause higher viral loads, and be more transmissible. But so far, it hasn't been associated with concern for escape from antibodies. What makes this mutation of particular interest um, standing out from the other 22 mutations in B117 is the fact that it's not just found in that variant, but it's actually found also in other rapidly spreading variants. And the next variant that I wanna talk about also contains this mutation. And this is variant B1351, which is also known as the South Africa variant. And I mentioned that B117 was called 501Y B1 and B1351 is called 501Y B2. Um, and while it's very confusing to have so many different names for these, I think keeping in mind that both of them share this 501Y mutation um, is actually pretty helpful. So this variant is called the South Africa variant because it was first noted to be arising in South Africa. Um, but like B117, B1351 has really spread throughout the world um, at this point, and also including uh, been detected in the United States, um, but with, with a much smaller number of cases so far identified and in a much uh, smaller number of states so far identified. So similar to B117, Variant B1351 has been shown to be increasing in frequency, has been shown to be more transmissible. And then what's concerning on top of that for this variant is that it's actually less susceptible to antibodies from both previously infected individuals, from vaccinated individuals, and as well, it's less susceptible to convalescent and monoclonal antibody uh, sera. So in addition to sort of the increased transmissibility, now we have a variant that's also concerning for immune escape. 
And investigating why that might be the case, um, we have to consider the fact that it contains a different set of mutations um, compared to B117. So as we kind of mentioned through the nomenclature, uh, variant B1351 contains mutation 501Y. That's the same one that was in B117. But it also contains a couple of other mutations within the receptor binding domain. Um, and I'm going to highlight one in particular called E484K, um, and then briefly mention a third one called K417N. And all three of these are in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. And what you're seeing in the picture on the right is the virus genome sort of spread out across the top panel in A, um, a picture of the vi virus structure in B. And you can see within that spike protein, which here is this purplish color, um, there are various components of the spike protein itself. And you can zone in and really look at the receptor binding domain itself. Um, and that's where all three of these mutations are found. So the mutation that I mentioned that I wanted to talk about now is E484K. Um, I've seen on Twitter, it'd be proposed that this mutation be called EEK, which I really like because it is kind of a scary mutation. Um, because similar to N501Y, it also helps increase binding to the ACE2 receptor. Um, but what's distinct is that it's not as neutralized as easily by convalescent sera from previously infected patients. And so this mutation in particular, I think, is why one of the reasons why it's concerning that B1351 is concerned to be uh, an escape mutation. Adding to concern about this mutation is that it's also found in other variants, which evolved independently. And so I'd like to move now to talk about the third variant um, that I wanted to talk about today, which is called P1. And this variant has been referred to as the Brazil variant because this is where it was um, previously noted. Um, and I'm sorry, this is a typo. It's not also referred to as 501Y B2. Um, and P1, um, as I mentioned, was originally identified in Brazil and has so far been recorded to spread to some other countries um, throughout the world, but isn't as globally recognized as the other two yet. P1 has been detected in the United States, but really only in a couple of cases so far um, in two specific states. Um, and it's one that people are really uh, monitoring for very carefully at this point. The reason why people are concerned about this variant in particular um, is because of growing evidence that it is also um, escapes from uh, uh, the immune response. And the first evidence came from the fact that this was um, noted to cause a surge of cases in Brazil. Um, and this was in a population that had already experienced a high rate of infection. So people in Brazil had presumed already to have developed um, substantial levels of immunity. And then this variant came in and caused a new surge of cases, raising concern that people weren't being protected by their prior infections. And in addition to that, on a population level, when you looked at an individual level, um, there were a number of cases reported of patients, individual patients being reinfected with P1. So they'd had a prior infection with some other variant um, and then got reinfected with P1. Um, and very similar to B1351, this virus contains the mutations N501Y, E484K, and 417N, which collectively could help explain both its um, increased spread and potential immune escape. So that's a lot to kind of go over pretty quickly, but I did wanna leave you with a few messages about specific variants and specific mutations that they're found in. Um, and so what I'm highlighting here is all three of the variants, B117, which is the UK variant, B1135, which is the South Africa variant, and P1, which is the Brazil variant. Um, all three of these have been noted to be increasing in frequency, um, and all three of these contain the specific mutation 501Y. On top of that, two of the lineages, the B1351 and the P1, contain an additional two mutations, E484K and K417N, um, and collectively, they're thought to contribute to less susceptibility to antibodies. So just to wrap up this part of the talk, um, hopefully it's everyone can agree that it's really crucial to identify and respond to changes in SARS-CoV-2 that make the virus more transmissible, more pathogenic, and or less susceptible to the immune response. Um, identifying and monitoring these important SARS-CoV-2 mutations and variants within an actual time frame requires substantial coordinated effort among hospitals, public health organizations, and researchers. Um, so there's really a huge group of people working uh, closely on this. 
And the message that I really want to give people is that preventing transmission is, is key to slowing evolution. Um, and in this uh, schematic on the right, I think there's a lot of focus on how the virus is evolving and how that might lead to increased transmission. So that's the arrow on the bottom of the picture. Um, but what we, what we really do know is that allowing the virus to be transmitted allows the virus to evolve. Um, and if we can do everything we can to really block transmission of the virus, um, that will help uh, reduce the evolution of these concerning variants. So um, I'll stop there. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. James Lawler to uh, take on the second part of the presentation. Thanks, Anne. <clears throat> I've been curiously trying to uh, answer questions in the Q&A. So I'm James Lawler. I am an infectious disease physician here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and one of the co-directors of our Global Center for Health Security. And um, Anne did a, a great job teeing up uh, um, these variant COVID strains and um, what, they, uh, what they are and uh, how they come to be. My talk is going to focus a little bit on uh, some of the points that, that Anne brought up about why we care. Uh, why are these variants important? How are they impacting transmissibility and, and um, potentially uh, vaccine-induced immunity and uh, other therapeutics that we use. So the, the first reason that we care about these variants is, uh, I think, <clears throat> now been evident in uh, a lot of media coverage uh, and um, things that folks are writing about the pandemic, and, and that is that some of these variants clearly appear to have uh, a higher uh, rates of transmissibility. Uh, the first major variant that um, was noted with concern about transmissibility, transmissibility was again this B117 variant or the UK variant that popped up um, uh, really in uh, mid to late November. And what prompted this was um, actually not um, genomic surveillance, although the UK has done an amazingly good job of sequencing virus more than any other country. Uh, but what initially prompted uh, folks in the UK to investigate was the fact that they had some uh, unusually large and um, prolific clusters of cases in Kent in the southeast of, of England. And looking at the epidemiology of those clusters, uh, public health authorities there became concerned that uh, the transmission dynamics looked different from what they were normally seeing with garden variety uh, coronavirus. And so uh, they actually started doing um, targeted sequencing there to see if there was a difference. And indeed, they found the B117 virus. Uh, and then retrospectively, were able to go back and look uh, at isolates that they had going all the way back into the summer and, and were able to identify that at least the first evidence they found of B117 was in September uh, and, and <clears throat> that had steadily increased. So what, what happened in the UK and again why we're concerned looking at that phenomenon is they had their fall wave uh, similar to the epidemic wave that many other countries uh, had uh, in, the, in the fall and into winter uh, and then seemed to be uh, trending down pretty significantly, as you can see there by the, the end of November, beginning of December. Uh, but at the same time, as you'll see, the, the proportion of B117 isolates was going up uh, significantly. And so this second surge they had, which was a, a pretty massive number of cases, um, was associated with that new variant. So you can see this is <clears throat> what their uh, epidemic curve looked like in terms of cases and deaths. And, and that second hump, again, much uh, higher than what they had seen previously and higher, even uh, significantly higher than uh, case counts per capita that we got to in, in the US. And um, with a proportionate increase in deaths as well, as you can see from that uh, second surge in, in deaths that occurred, you know, starting in late December and early January. And on the right, this graph is the proportion of viruses uh, that are this B117 variant uh, per one of their main reference labs. So the way that uh, Public Health England has set up their uh, coronavirus testing, they have a lot of high throughput test 
testing capacity and centralized laboratories. So it gives them really good visibility uh, into uh, viruses, um, uh, which they can look at via a PCR signature for this particular virus. And so they have really good insight in, into the proportion of this. And so you can see that correlation is pretty strong. And that second surge seems to, to be you know, directly associated with that rise of B117. In the, the contact tracing studies and some of the other studies that were then done, looking at the outbreak in England at the time, it became clear that the B117 variant is probably uh, 35 to 45% more transmissible than uh, the previous garden variety strains of coronavirus that had been circulating. And there were initially reports that even up to 70% more transmissible, but I think most data um, probably comes in at around, uh, you know, between 30 and 50%. But obviously that's a significant jump in transmissibility. And that translates into a dramatically increased number of, of cases and hospitalizations and deaths. And that's where, you know, sometimes the, the math doesn't necessarily become obvious to us un, until you uh, work it out, but you, you'd actually much rather have a virus that is somewhat more lethal uh, compared to a virus that is more transmissible because the more transmissible virus causes many more cases. And even if it's not more lethal, you'll end up getting more hospitalizations and deaths. The reality of B117 is that it actually looks to be a bit more uh, lethal and more uh, virulent in addition to more transmissible. So it kind of is a, a double whammy. And so when you start to look across the, the globe, where we have countries that have well-documented increases in variant strains, uh, we see this disturbing trend in, in this double uh, humped uh, epidemic within the last uh, several months. So as you can see, this is a, a graph that overlays several countries, the UK there we talked about before. Israel, you can see, had a very similar experience. And we know now that uh, by December, January, uh, roughly 80% of the viruses um, characterized in Israel were the B117 variant from, uh, from the UK. And so that uh, had a similar course to what the UK saw, where they had an earlier fall wave, they seemed to control that, and then it came roaring back with an even larger wave associated with B117. We've seen the same phenomenon in uh, Brazil and South Africa. Uh, now, those are associated with different strains, as, as Anne pointed out, in South Africa, this is the B1351 uh, South African variant, and in Brazil, it's the P1 Brazilian variant. <clears throat> but they all have this 501 mutation that seems to potentially increase transmissibility. And the Brazil and South Africa variants have additional mutations that are concerning that we'll talk about. Now, these uh, um, per capita humps look smaller in Brazil and South Africa. Uh, and indeed they are, but, but also keep in mind that uh, the testing capacity of these two countries is also not uh, where the UK and Israel are in terms of their ability to do um, you know, adequate numbers of tests per capita. So this probably dramatically under ascertains the number of true cases in Brazil and South Africa. And it's probably true that their epidemic curves are, are even larger uh, than what we see in the UK and Israel. So Brazil is an especially concerning case study of these variants. And in particular, um, what has concerned many experts is what's happened in, in the city of Manaus. So Manaus, as you can see from the map, is um, a large city in the north of Brazil. It's actually the largest city on the Amazon River. Uh, and Manaus had a huge outbreak of COVID uh, that started back in April and, and really went uh, through early summer. And uh, as you can see from the graph below in that paper that was uh, published in Science, um, researchers estimate that uh, over 75% of the population of Manaus was infected with SARS-CoV-2 during that outbreak. So by August um, uh, and into uh, September, again, over 75% of Manaus residents were seropositive. So this is a community that really should have reached uh, herd immunity threshold. Uh, based on, on what we know about the, the epidemiology of this virus. Um, nevertheless, um, in, uh, in the late, late fall and, and into winter, so really, um, you know, over the last couple of months, Manaus has experienced another uh, very large outbreak. While we don't have, um, you know, sufficient 
um, visibility into real time testing results uh, to know, um, you know, the, the cases per capita that they're experiencing. Uh, it's large enough that hospitals have been overwhelmed in Manaus. Uh, oxygen supplies have run low. And so we know it appears to be a, a, an epidemic that is every bit as big as the one that they experienced earlier in the year. And so that's obviously very concerning that with the, the previous um, garden variety circulating coronavirus, they had a huge outbreak. And it's really kind of the, 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 the study of what an unmitigated outbreak uh, in a city looks like. Uh, and nevertheless, even though they had uh, very widespread immunity based on that outbreak, uh, this outbreak that is probably completely associated with the P1 variant uh, appears to be able to infect large swaths of the population despite that underlying immunity. And, and that's really one of the main concerns we have about these new variants is they may be um, able to escape previous immunity, at least uh, from infection with previous virus for natural infection uh, that they're still able to cause large outbreaks in communities that have, in theory, even reached a uh, herd immunity threshold. So um, <clears throat> what has then been done to, to look more closely at why this may be is to start uh, examining some of these uh, variants and some of the mutations they have and see what the effects are uh, with um, neutralizing antibody titers. So uh, we don't currently necessarily know what the best correlates for immunity of uh, SARS-CoV-2 are. Uh, so um, it, it is not clear that um, neutralizing antibody titers are, are the end all be all of judging uh, how, uh, how someone is immune, but they are one of the easier tools we have and they tend in most uh, diseases to correlate uh, relatively well. Certainly in the vaccine studies that have been done to date, it does appear that vaccines that elicit a very high neutralizing antibody titer have a much uh, better chance of uh, proving efficacy in clinical trials. But again, take this with a grain of salt because we don't know exactly how neutralizing antibodies uh, correlate. But this is a study that was done um, looking at various different mutations uh, and how that affects neutralizing antibodies. So what you can see here is these uh, more darkly colored sections of this um, three-dimensional model of the, the spike protein. So this is the protein, again, that Ann talked about that sticks out of the virus and uh, enables it to attach to its receptor in cells and actually invade cells. And those darker areas are the receptor binding domain. That's the business end or, you know, the pointy end of the, the spear for the, the spike protein. And that's where some of these more concerning mutations lie the 484 mutation, for instance, which is shared by the South Africa and, uh, and Brazil P1 variant. And, and that receptor binding domain is where those antibodies come and actually bind that are the best neutralizing antibodies. And when you change the shape of that binding site, you impede those antibodies abilities to come get a, a tight good bind. What this group found is when they looked at some of these variants <clears throat> and they took, um, <clears throat> serum from previously infected folks who had high neutralizing antibody titers, they found that with specific mutations and most, um, most significantly with this 484 mutation, you had a dramatic reduction in, in neutralizing antibody ability, right? So 10 to 100 fold almost uh, reduction in uh, neutralization of these antibodies. So it indicates that with that particular mutation, uh, the neutralizing antibodies that people have that probably uh, potentially play a significant role in protection don't work as well anymore. And that's why particularly the, the P1 strain in Brazil and the 351 strain in South Africa appear to have the ability to partially at least escape immunity from vaccines. Uh, and we think this will, will significantly impact the ability of our monoclonal antibody therapies to treat these variants. So this is uh, again, another study that was done looking at neutralizing antibody titers from uh, South African donors and uh, looking at the effect on, um, you know, a, a, a construct virus with the receptor binding domain antibody only, and then the, the South African 351 variant, which as Anne said, there's so much nomenclature changes that it's hard to keep track, but that P501YV2 uh, is, is the same as the South African 351. 
And essentially what you see there is when on the left, you had good neutralizing antibodies from all of those patients against the original virus. Uh, for the South African variant, all of those black boxes are essentially where no more neutralizing antibodies, right? It completely escapes the ability of those antibodies to neutralize the virus. And even in the other ones where you do have some neutralizing effect, it's dramatically um, below what it was for natural uh, wild type virus. So again, reinforcing this idea that the, the variant, uh, South African variant virus, uh, and probably because of that 4A4 mutation is able to escape neutralizing antibody inactivation. So uh, this obviously led people to, to be very concerned about whether vaccines are going to be able to provide adequate immunity because all of the vaccines that we have in the US right now and those that are lined up coming down the pipe are all directed specifically against the spike protein. And the, the most potent neutralizing antibodies that are elicited by those vaccines appear to be targeted at that receptor binding domain. Many of them are. And so there was concern, obviously, and there still is, that these variants will then potentially allow those viruses to escape immunity. Now, we started looking at a number of different viruses to try and see if we can detect this uh, you know, in laboratory experiments. And this was a study done by Moderna uh, scientists uh, themselves, along with the Vaccine Research Center at NIH, looking at both the B117 UK variant and the, and the B1351 South African uh, variant to see if uh, neutralizing antibodies elicited by Moderna vaccine, right? So this is people vaccinated with the Moderna vaccine and then uh, look at the effect of their serum on the virus. And you see that for the B117, there really didn't seem to be a, a decrement in neutralizing antibody um, from uh, you know, wild type virus. But for the B1351 strain, or the South African strain, there was a a, a relatively significant uh, uh, decrease in neutralizing antibody titer, almost sixfold. Now, the, it's still left titer as well within the range of what we think are associated with good immune protection. So um, this seems to suggest that the Moderna vaccine still should protect against the 351 virus, but perhaps uh, slightly less well. So additional uh, research was then done by uh, the Pfizer folks to look at whether there was effect on their vaccine. And again, a similar finding as you can see down below that the virus with the 484 and 501 uh, mutations, which is essentially what uh, describes the uh, South African variant, you can see there was a, a slight decrease in neutralizing antibody titer with that virus as well compared to the wild type virus slightly less than what they saw for the Moderna vaccine, uh, twofold or so, but to be honest with different techniques, uh, you know, it's hard to, to draw one-to-one -one comparison. So both of these studies I think show that there might be some decrease in immunity with, uh, with these new variant viruses for people vaccinated with the, the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. There still uh, appears to be relatively robust neutralizing antibody titers that are elicited by the vaccines. And so we would predict that you might see a slight uh, decrement in protection, but protection is probably still going to be uh, more than adequate. Um, and what we've seen, um, you know, is the, the beginning, at least, of some data out of Israel that would confirm this. So Israel has uh, had a very aggressive uh, vaccination campaign uh, associated, you know, temporarily with the large outbreak that they've been having. And, and also Israel has been really great at gathering data on uh, vaccine efficacy. So uh, well over 65% of the population of Israel has now been vaccinated, and they obviously started with um, uh, older, more vulnerable populations, uh, more high-risk populations, similar to what we've seen. And so just recently, this uh, paper manuscript was published looking at the effect uh, on the epidemic in Israel. Next, please. And what they found was, uh, you know, correlating with the second dose of vaccine rollout among the population, they saw a, an associated uh, pretty significant decline in uh, infections uh, in folks over the age of 60 compared to the rest of the population. And you can see that those curves there diverge around, uh, you know, the 20th or so of, of January. And so, uh, and, and uh, 
Israel is using the Pfizer vaccine uh, as their national vaccine in this program. And so, again, what is encouraging is, is backing up those data we saw about neutralizing antibody titers is now in a real population. These preliminary data seem to indicate that the Pfizer vaccine at least uh, gives adequate protection uh, in, uh, in populations uh, so that the, the people who were vaccinated, which at this time was primarily folks over the age of 60, uh, seem to have a significant decrease in, uh, in infection rate compared to others. And that also translates into hospitalizations, as you can uh, see there in, in graphs B and D. And so this is very encouraging that at least against the B117 strain, um, that um, uh, Moderna and, and Pfizer, the mRNA vaccines, probably will have very good efficacy. And again, I should, I should reiterate, as I did before, you know, over 80% of the viruses in Israel by this time uh, were thought to be the B117 strain. Um, now, what is a, a little more concerning is where, you know, other clinical trial data now from South Africa uh, and, and Brazil may seem to indicate that uh, there, there may be uh, more decrement of immune protection when you're dealing with the uh, South African or Brazil variants. And so uh, data has just really started to come out over the last couple of weeks about this. Uh, Novavax uh, released a, a press release that uh, we haven't been able to see all of the data uh, published uh, in, in, in a real scientific manuscript, but the data that we've seen so far out of the UK and South Africa indicate that the Novavax virus, which is again, essentially a protein-based adjuvanted vaccine against the spike protein, uh, indicates that again, for B117, uh, there's probably a slight decrease in, in efficacy. So 95.6% with the old wild type strain versus 85% with the B117 strain. So uh, maybe a 10% decrease in, in efficacy, but 85% is still spectacular and certainly good enough. What was a little more concerning was the data from South Africa, again, a much smaller study, um, and, and so you know more difficult to draw firm conclusions. But what they seemed to see in South Africa, where over ninety percent of those viruses were the new South African variant, is they had a dramatic drop in efficacy, forty-nine percent overall. Uh, now, when they did a subgroup analysis and they took out folks who were HIV positive, and in South Africa that often indicates more advanced HIV and immunocompromising conditions but the, the efficacy uh, was still only 60% in HIV negative patients. So that's a pretty dramatic drop. If you think about the wild type efficacy should be about 95, 96%. And now we're talking 60% at best, that's a 35% a decrease in efficacy. And that's, that's a pretty significant drop. What we also saw from Johnson and Johnson's uh, report of their trial data and, and more of that hopefully will be coming out when they're uh, submission to FDA Verpac comes out soon, but uh, they similarly saw a pretty significant drop in efficacy uh, in their trial in South Africa. So 72% uh, kind of for wild type virus in their uh, US study and 57% in South Africa, where again, the vast majority were this new South African variant. Now it's, it's a little bit difficult. It's not an apples to apples comparison because J&J's trial had slightly different endpoint and outcome data. Uh, but, but again, it looks as if there's a significant decrease in efficacy when you're looking at the, the South African uh, B1351 variant. Uh, and so uh, almost wrapping it up here, the, the AZ vaccine, I, I think many saw that there was a, a, a release uh, about the efficacy there that seemed to indicate <clears throat> Uh, dramatically reduced um, uh, ability to protect against the South African strain uh, from the clinical trial that was done there, only 22% efficacy. And in fact, South Africa stopped the rollout of that uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine based on the data that came out of the preliminary analysis of this clinical trial. And so that is um, clearly a concern. And, and obviously we need to do more research to see uh, whether uh, additional doses or even mix and match dosing of, uh, you know, a, uh, an AZ vaccine, which is a, a adenovirus vectored vaccine combined with a protein or an mRNA vaccine may give you adequate protection even against these new variants. But what seems to be clear is that these new variants do have uh, some significant impact on vaccine 
immunity and um, we may need uh, in, in the future, if these variants continue to arise uh, and become more prevalent, we may need to tweak our vaccines uh, with, to, to be able to give boosters that will protect against uh, these new variants as well. And I think this is the last thing to talk about is <clears throat> again, because um, essentially these therapeutic products uh, that have been rolled out in the last couple of months, these monoclonal antibody products, which have proven to be very effective in preventing hospitalization and death uh, if administered early. You know, these are essentially laboratory made neutralizing antibodies, right? They target specifically that receptor binding domain that we, uh, that we talked about where the 484 mutation affects the confirmation. And so uh, there is, um, I think, significant and warranted concern that these new variants, the Brazil and, and the South African variants, uh, may, may very well not be responsive to treatment with the monoclonal antibody products that have proven to be a really valuable tool. Probably, honestly, the, the single or the two now most uh, beneficial therapeutic tools we have are the, the, the Lilly and Regeneron monoclonal antibody products that have EUA authorization uh, for treatment. And so, um, those, those two products may very well be significantly impacted uh, if uh, new variants become uh, predominant within the US. So uh, lastly, um, you know, I, I think it's important to think about uh, what the future looks like as, as Anne uh, suggested, uh, the B117 variant in particular is the first out of the gate and is uh, increasing at an alarming rate within the US. This was a paper that came out from a group out of Helix Labs and Scripps. So this lab uses um, a PCR test uh, that is able to detect uh, with high probability the B117 variant because one of the three targets is affected by the uh, deletion mutation at 69 of the spike protein. And so you get drop out of that one target. And what uh, the Helix Lab has seen is a dramatic rise in uh, the number of S gene target failure uh, isolates they have uh, in their testing. And you can see that in Florida, uh, that rate is already well over 5%. And across the country, that rate has been doubling, uh, they estimate around every nine or 10 days. And so that means that uh, by the middle uh, to late part of March, uh, the B117 variant will be uh, the most predominant strain uh, of virus circulating in the US. And this also confirms the data that came out of the UK that appear uh, to, to indicate that the virus is 35 to 45% more transmissible uh, than, um, uh, than wild type virus. So um, that's what we're staring down uh, the barrel of and um, uh, you know, just uh, confirms the need to uh, vaccinate as quickly as possible and also to take uh, double down on uh, all of the community mitigation efforts to reduce transmission so that we can better uh, identify uh, and quarantine and isolate around these cases. So I think that's all I have and uh, turn it back to you, Radu. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, James, and thanks, Anne, for these wonderful talks. I think if you, and can you also just come back on video as well? So um, for next, well, about eight minutes or so that we have left, I just want to go over some questions that have come up and some questions that I think are appropriate for our audience to really understand at least, you know, the next steps and what this actually means for uh, what's going on with these variants. Um, and so I open this up to both of you. How do we get to this point? You know, we have, we've been talking about variants for some time now. And when we're talking about coronaviruses, we're looking at an RNA virus, right? So inherently RNA viruses don't replicate that frequently. Granted, there's a global pandemic, so that causes it to have several more mutations. So is it just because of that? Or do you think there's any role of vaccination strategies that have come into play as well that have caused further mutations? Or what really has led us to come to this point where we have all these huge and variant differences of, uh, of variants that are out there right now? I, I just typed an answer in the chat to a similar question. So I'm happy to kind of jump in here. I, I think it's such a um, important question. And as you pointed out, I mean, RNA viruses, you know, we're used to thinking about them mutating a ton. Um, and in the beginning, I think maybe of us, maybe a lot of us were lulled into a false sense of security because um, initially the sequences that were becoming available for SARS-CoV-2 didn't show a lot of diversity. Um, and unlike some RNA viruses, SARS-CoV-2 actually has some proofreading capability um, in the enzyme that it uses to replicate itself. 
Um, but when you have such a huge population of infected individuals, I mean, you're just giving the virus so many opportunities to mutate. Um, and there will be a lot of mutations that won't be functionally important or that will even be harmful to the virus. Um, but when ones do arise that benefit the virus, either by making it more transmissible or by allowing it to escape from um, immune responses, uh, there, there's really a lot of opportunity for those beneficial variants and beneficial mutations to spread. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and I, and I think in, in essence, it's like spinning the roulette wheel and, and every human infection with the virus is another spin at the wheel. Eventually, you know, the virus gets lucky and finds mutations that, um, you know, give it uh, advantage in transmissibility or, uh, or some other uh, factor. And, and I also think, you know, it's, it's a bit concerning that we're seeing uh, all of these lineages arise simultaneously from different places in the globe that seems to indicate that this is kind of a convergent phenomenon in evolution. So there's some force driving the virus towards these new variants. And, and it, it seems most likely that this is underlying partial immunity from previous infection. That's the one thing that's changed now versus six months ago. We have a large proportion of many communities that have some partial uh, immunity based on previous infection. And, th and that you know may be nudging the virus along in its evolution to um, you know, unfortunately, places that seem to make it uh, more, uh, more transmissible, potentially more virulent, and certainly uh, able to, in, in some instances, escape vaccine and, and certainly monoclonal antibody therapy. But do you think that that's due to the fact that we're actually getting better at sequencing now as opposed to the beginning of the pandemic where we weren't able to really adequately sequence at all or we didn't really know what we're dealing with? Now... You know, especially the UK and Israel is doing a phenomenal job of sequencing in the US, not so much, but is that what's really coming to play or is it just like you're saying, maybe the natural progression of the virus itself? You know, I, I'd love to hear Ann's thoughts. I, I think that, you know, we're certainly sequencing more, but we did not see these particular mutations uh, with frequency earlier. And I think if they, had, if they had arisen earlier, we would have seen them predominate more quickly because, you know, with B117, for instance, it's clearly more transmissible, right? It has competitive advantage over the other wild type virus. So I, I think if it would have emerged in May, we would have seen it a lot earlier. So I think these things seem to be a new phenomenon. I, I don't think we're, we're just catching them because we're sequencing more. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And I think um, that there's that line of, of evidence, um, the fact that we would have probably picked it up just due to the fact that they're increasing in, in frequency. Um, groups are no, now going back and kind of filling in time by sequencing older samples as well. Um, and then it's all, also um, uh, very feasible to do ancestral reconstructions um, based on kind of current virus sequences of, of when they might have emerged and when they might have first developed. Um, and really kind of all of those lines of evidence are, are pointing to these being truly recent um, phenomena. So then what would you think we can do to suppress a number of variants? Is it just increasing testing and sequencing? Is it maintaining social distance for longer periods of time, identifying local outbreaks and then shutting down those areas? Or what, what strategies would possibly work in that scenario? Yes. <laughs> yes to all. <laughs> yeah, I agree. We, we need to suppress community transmission to as low a level as possible so that we can you know, be much better at, at quickly identifying, um, you know, quarantining and isolating around cases. Uh, and, and we have the ability to sequence a larger proportion of cases so that we can start to do good contact tracing, right? So that's one thing. The second thing that I think we need to focus on as, as a country, and I haven't seen a, a lot of talk about this yet or, or a specific effort is, is we really need to identify vaccine breakthrough cases, right? If you have a positive case and somebody who's been vaccinated, we need to investigate that thoroughly uh, to see if what we're, what we're experiencing is breakthrough because of the variant. So any break, breakthrough case needs to be sequenced and we need to do aggressive epidemiologic investigation around those. Well, I think that's gonna be interesting, right? If you're thinking about the quote unquote South African variant and how AstraZeneca is not really getting approved there because of the fact that they have so many increased cases of patients getting sick with that vaccine or not actually, it's not having any significant effect on it. So if that does come to other parts of the world where patients are getting the AstraZeneca vaccine, it's not really gonna be effective. And then you're gonna to get to a point where people are gonna be competing for different kinds of vaccines, right? I think 
you know, ideally we're in a situation where we have millions or billions of vaccines available for everyone to get the correct dose and the correct one. But I think the, the concern with these variants coming in is, is enormous. Now, what about vaccine modifications? You mentioned briefly about boosters. What do you think, James, as far as how are we gonna be able to modify these vaccines? So if someone, let's say, starts with the Moderna vaccine one year, and by the fall of next year, there's a different variant that's now taking over in that region of the country. Do they get the same one with a booster? Do they get a different vaccine? Or what, what scenario are we looking down in the next few months to years? Uh, I, I think that's hard to predict. Uh, you know, right now, in reality, I think the, the vaccines that we have, certainly the mRNA vaccines, are probably going to give good protection, um, even against the new variant strains. Now, may, may be less good in terms of mild disease and, and, and shedding, but I think they still appear to provide, you know, very good protection against severe disease, hospitalization, uh, et cetera. Um, now, it, it may be that eventually we'll need to, you know, th this will be similar to flu, right? Every year, every three years, who knows how frequently we may need to get a booster. And that booster may be slightly different from the previous vaccine we got to try and uh, keep up with, uh, you know, mutations in the virus and, and variants. Um, it, it also may be, and it at least there's pre preliminary evidence that, you know, let's say if you get boosted, if you get an initial vaccine with one, uh, you know, construct and a, a booster vaccine with a slightly different one, you still get kind of general immunity against all of the different cousins that may be out there. So, um, you know, it, that's seen in, in some cases with flu as well. The more flu vaccines you get, the better immunity you have to kind of all flu vaccines that look similar. And, and so, um, I, I think we'll have to wait and see exactly, uh, you know, what the strategy needs to be based on data. But I, I think this makes it more likely that we're going to have to get booster vaccines at some interval uh, for SARS-CoV-2. All right. Well, um, it's the top of the hour. So this was a wonderful talk. I want to thank again, Dr. Anne Piantadosi and Dr. James Lawler for taking some time to discuss this with us. I think it's an enormous topic. Obviously, we've had over 2,000 people register for this event. So thank you again. If you have any questions, always email us at info at neetech.org. Um, and yeah, if there's anything else further, you can uh, join us on social media. And we're always glad to answer any questions out there as well. Um, but again, thanks to Anne and James for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And thanks to everyone else. Goodbye.